All right. Well, welcome all of you to this special edition of our weekly Bible study. We're actually meeting on Saturday evening today. It is still Shabbat. And I want to thank all of you that are here with us live today. Those that are joining us on Zoom. And certainly those that will be seeing this on Tuesday when it drops on our YouTube channel. We appreciate each and every one of you. I definitely appreciate all the comments that we've been getting. Questions that have been coming in. Questions and answers. I, I enjoy all of that. And so that, that keeps me fired up. That keeps me going from week to week. And so we want to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're still dealing with our series on being free from strong delusion. And we're going to be dealing with a very serious delusion today. Uh, we're going to be kicking out some uh, sacred cows, I guarantee you that. And so we're looking forward to this study. And I believe it's going to be a real eye-opener for nine out of ten of you today, uh, if not more. So we're going to go ahead and pray and get started. We're going to get right into this lesson and get ready to have some fun. All right. So, Let's use Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with thy commandments and command us to engross ourselves in the words of your Torah. And as always, Yahweh, we count it an honor and a privilege to do just that, to be able to get into your Torah, your, your teaching and instruction, and, and be enlightened by your words. We appreciate all that you've done for us, providing us with your, your teaching. Hallelujah. So with that, we're going to go into this lesson. All right, so you should be seeing my screen now. We're talking about breaking free from strong delusions, part 11, rapture and going to heaven. Rapture and going to heaven. All right. So as always, I want to remind you to get a chance to visit Dr. Russ E. Hoover, our YouTube channel. Get a chance to do all those youtube -y things, right? You want to make sure you're subscribing to the channel. Watch the videos and hit that thumbs up, which is a like. And hit that bell of notification so you can be notified when we're dropping our new videos. We normally get them out on Tuesday mornings, somewhere between 11 and 12. So make sure that you're getting that bell of notification. And by all means, leave your questions and comments uh, in the comment section. Uh, we get a chance to get to those as quickly as we possibly can, get a chance to give you answers. And so far, we've been getting good responses from those who have been ma making those requests. So make sure you're doing all those YouTube things. And we would greatly appreciate that. All right. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our lesson. And we know from previous lessons that Satan has his methods of working in the world. And I'm committed to keeping these things before you. The, the more you get a, a revelation of this and you walk in this reality, it's going to help you to keep your eyes wide open when the devil is trying to work to deceive you. And so we know that Satan deceives the whole world. That's a reason to be on alert right there, right? It is just say one or two. But it says here in Revelation 12 and 9 that Satan deceives the whole world. Uh, he does not stand in truth. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources because he is the father of lies. Satan is the God of this world, blinding the minds of those who are perishing. And he transforms himself into an angel of light, the scriptures tell us in 2 Corinthians. So he wants to appear as if he's, he's bringing you light and truth, but he's full of darkness, full of ignorance, full of blindness, full of lies. He has ministers who preach and teach about Messiah, but they are actually ministers for his deception. Well, that is a slick trick right there, right? You got people going, people looking all... You know, swab with their long robes on and looking like they just stepped out of heaven and they're full of uh, Satan uh, deception and lies and they're leading people to the slaughter. You know, I really hate that 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 particular verse of scripture. You know, it's revealing a truth, but the reality of it, it, it really boils my blood. All right, I'm going to read that one again. He has ministers who preach and teach about Messiah but they're actually ministers for his deception. So that means you gotta be on the lookout when you're just going to church. You can't just be going into any old body's church, right? You can't just be listening to any old preacher. You gotta know those who labor among you, right? You gotta be aware of their lifestyle, their background, you know, make certain that you're aware of, of who you're being taught from, 
right? Just don't take anybody and listen to anything that everybody got to say. That includes myself, right? You got to be aware of, of the people. Feel free to do a background check. You know, you won't find any women going around saying, I've, I've been with him. I've been married you know, over four, 41 years. There's not a woman on this planet that say I've made any undue advances to her. No child, nobody's saying that, right? So you got to know the people that labor among you. The devil is our adversary. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. So if you are not vigilant and sound-minded, he can very likely devour you. So last week we examined Freemasonry, which is an ancient religion. It's been around for a long time and it tracks its, its foundations back to the Tower of Babel and Nimrod. They claim him to be one of the first of the Masons, right? So that's going a long ways back. Albert Pike, one of the Masons, one of the renowned Masons, if you will. He's, he's the only Mason, and keep in mind now, he was a Confederate uh, soldier but he had a, a statue built in Washington, D.C. That's letting you know right there how much they esteemed Albert Pike, this 33rd degree Mason. So he reached the pinnacle of this satanic religion. And we talked about the Albert Pike letter to Mazzini. That was a pretty deep letter. And I, I want to encourage you to go back to last week's lesson and get a chance to hear what he had to say about the three world wars two of which has already passed. And, and he, he wrote that letter 50 years before the First World War. And the goals of that First World War were everything that he had in that letter. Same thing for the Second World War. In the Third World War, which has not happened yet, based upon what he wrote, it is right on track. It is right on track. You know, Muslim and, and Jewish feuding, which is going on in the Middle East as we speak. The Masonic plan to destroy Christianity were also included within that Pike letter. And he outlined his plans to really destroy Christianity. And also, even those that are not Christian, he just wants to have everybody worship the devil. That's his whole goal. Everybody worshiping Satan. And so he's outlined his plan for that to take place. And then we discussed the devastating impact of the pre-tribulation rapture on the church. It is not a biblical doctrine. But many in the church world are embracing this rapture doctrine, this pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, with the expectation of escaping the earth uh, when all the madness starts, right? When the, when the seven-year tribulation starts, mainstream Christianity fully expects to get their uh, exit card and to be leaving the earth before the madness starts. And so when they realize that all the turmoil is going on from corner to corner of the earth, and they're still here, it's going to cause great disillusionment. And even the scriptures talked about the fact that uh, there's going to be a great falling away that's going to occur when the Antichrist comes on the scene. And so this falling away is going to become because of expectations unfulfilled, right? Expectations unfulfilled in mainstream Christianity. So today we're going to continue our discussion on some of these topics. Uh, the rapture, and we're going to add to that going into heaven. Now, this is a sacred cow that we got to get some clarity on. So where does the concept of going to heaven come from? Is it biblical? Is there life after death? Do Yahushua teach that believers will reside permanently in heaven? Let's read that again because we got to get this. Did Yahushua teach that believers will reside permanently in heaven? So let's find out. Starting off in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne in his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father. Enter the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Skip down to verse 41. And he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed. Enter the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty 
and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Adon, when do we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch you did not do this to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So from these verses, we can conclude that there is an afterlife for both the righteous and the unrighteous. But what about heaven? Let's continue. Mark 9. And if your foot caused you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of Elohim with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast in the hell's fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's interesting. It's just a sidebar here. But when you read this right here, that verse 48, he's talking about being cast into hell's fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, now when you think about a worm, normally after a rainfall, you'll see worms that'll be up on the sidewalk. And, and because there was so much water, they were able to deal with it. But then when the rain ceases and the sun comes out, those worms are scorched. And you'll see them burnt to the sidewalk, especially if it's a really, really hot day. So when he's talking about a worm that does not die in hell's fire, that sounds somewhat unusual, right? But do you realize that it was discovered? There was lava that was coming out of an ocean. And this lava steady poured out. And as it poured out, they discovered that there were actually worms living in that lava. They discovered that. So that brought credibility to these verses of scriptures right here. When he says, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Every now and then, the Most High will insert little things like that in his word that will help us to know and understand the truth of his word. Right? So where the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. John 14, and this is a big one. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in Elohim, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, dwellings, or staying places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Yahushua began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. So clearly the Bible discusses the kingdom of heaven. So obviously, heaven is our destination. Correct? Our goal is to make heaven our home, right? Now, these are questions that people ask. But actually, no. Now, I know based on those scriptures, you just got to hear me preach, especially from John, in my father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places, many places to stay. So obviously, we have to be going to heaven, right? But my answer is no. And what are you saying? Please say it ain't so. That's, that's what mainstream Christianity is saying right now. You you lying up in here, preacher, right? But the concept of going to heaven is not a biblical concept. It is not. Doesn't the Bible teach that I make heaven my home, right? I mean, this message, I guarantee you, is going to blow a lot of minds. Now, am I just preaching this? Am I just teaching this lesson just to have some fun with y'all? 
right? Just to blow your mind at the end, I'm gonna say, surprise, I'm just kidding. No, actually, the idea that souls go to heaven at death originated in pagan religion, not the Bible. A brief look at ancient history reveals that the people of Babylon, Egypt, and other kingdoms imagined such an afterlife. Say what? How dare you? I know. I know. If y'all could reach through the screen, y'all probably slapping me right now. And I want you to know right now that we're going to be killing some sacred cows in this place today. So just get ready. And just in case, it is not yet clear, in case those in the back did not hear what I had to say, we will not spend eternity in heaven. I said it again. I want to make this clear. We will not spend eternity in heaven. So get your pencils, get your pads, get ready to take some notes. We're getting ready to take this ride. I got to prove this. Now, I've, I've said it. Now I got to prove it. According to this believing world by Lewis Brown, the Egyptian god Osiris was thought to have been killed, resurrected, and taken to heaven. Osiris came to life again. He was miraculously resurrected from the dead and taken up to heaven. And there in heaven, so the myth declares, he lives on eternally. Brown explains, the Egyptians reason that if it was the fate of the god Osiris to be resurrected after death, then a way could be found to make it the fate of man too the bliss of immortality that had formerly been reserved only for kings was then promised to all men. The heavenly existence of the dead was carried on in the realm of Osiris, and it was described in considerable detail by the Egyptian theologians. So the concept of going to heaven did not originate with the way. And when we talk about the way, we're talking about the biblical name that was given to the believers after Yeshua's resurrection. And this is a term that was used in the book of Acts. It was called the way. They were not called Christians. It was called the way. So the concept of going to heaven did not originate with the way, the true biblical belief given to the Yahudim of the Most High Elohim. To complicate matters further, the Catholic Church added the doctrine of purgatory to further confuse people about this subject of going to heaven. So purgatory, the condition, process, or place of purification or temporary punishment in which, according to medieval Christian and Roman Catholic belief, the souls of those who died in a state of grace are made ready for heaven. So purgatory. The Latin term is purgatorium, from purgar, to purge. It has come to refer as well to a wide range of historical and modern conceptions of post-mortem suffering short of everlasting damnation. So they've, they've created this place of purgatory to help you to get to heaven. So the Pope would allow relatives to pay for their loved ones exit from purgatory and enter heaven through indulgences, what they call them, indulgences. An indulgence is a way to compensate priests for the prayers they prayed on behalf of deceased family members for their eternal salvation. Did y'all get that? An indulgence is a way to compensate the priesthood for the prayers they prayed on behalf of deceased family members for their eternal salvation. So Yeshua, during his earthly ministry, Yeshua warned of a day when false religious leaders would take advantage of survivors when their loved ones passed away. Read about that in Matthew 23, verse 14. Woe to you, scribe and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you do what? Devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. So he prophesied about this event where people will be praying, 
you know, you got a, a widow, widower who's who's survived their their loved one dying, and now they're they're devouring the widow's houses. What does that mean? They're taking their resources through prayers. I mean, he prophesied about this as the very thing that the Catholic Church did. All right. So teaching that salvation is free is one of the 95 theses of Martin Luther that caused the Protestant Reformation. It's one of the things that he did right. Right? It's one of the things he did right, revealing this madness of praying people out of purgatory into heaven and asking for these indulgences or, or paying for the prayers. So this doctrine of going to heaven is a pagan belief that was incorporated into the Christian church doctrine to confuse the masses and lead those who do not read their Bibles to the Antichrist. First Timothy four, the great apostasy. Now the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So this, this doctrine of going to heaven, and this doctrine of purgatory, all this is nothing but a doctrine of demons. Satan creates false doctrines to bring about confusion among the religious ignorant who fail to make Bible study a priority. That's his goal. Let's create some confusion. So if going to heaven is not a biblical doctrine, what exactly does the Bible say on this topic? And where will we spend eternity? Let's begin the process of answering these questions. Again, let's visit Matthew 4, 17. From the time that Yahushua began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 5 and 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 11. For surely I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence take it by force. So during his earthly ministry, Yahushua seemed to be speaking of the kingdom of heaven in the present tense, not a future tense, not some event that's gonna be happening in the future, right? Not something that is reserved only for the afterlife. He seemed to be talking about something going on in the present. He said, from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, right? So he's talking about something that's taking place in this realm, in, the, in this kingdom of heaven realm. Look at Colossians 1. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now keep in mind, Paul wrote this letter when he was living. And he wrote this letter to the living, right? He was not deceased writing this letter to deceased people. He was living, writing this letter to the living. I, I hope everybody's clear on that, right? So with that said, let's read this letter. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who will deliver us from the power of darkness. Is that what the scripture said? Who might deliver us from the power of darkness. It didn't say that, right? It says clearly here, verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. That is a present situation that we can inherit for an event that's already happened in the past. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and check this out now, and has translated us into the kingdom. Hmm. And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Already, this, this living apostle writing this letter to these living believers is telling these people that they have already been translated 
into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of heaven is a realm, a spiritual realm. There is the spiritual realm and there is the physical realm. So when we're talking about this kingdom of heaven, we're talking about a spiritual realm, something you can't see with your eye. But because we are spirit beings, many of us are not really in touch with our spiritual being. But I'm going to give you a clue who you are. You are a spirit. You live in a fleshly body. And you have an eternal soul. You are a three-part being. The highest part of you is spiritual. Everything begins in the spiritual realm. We are spirit, possessing an eternal soul, living in a temporal or temporary body. Okay? So get that, and let's continue with this lesson. So look at this again now. Giving thanks to the Father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who has already delivered us from the power of darkness and has already translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And how did that take place? Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So the fact that we're in him, right? We, we've been washed in his blood. We're now in him. And being in, in him now, we have received this redemptive process to be redeemed, to be bought back. We've been bought back from our sinful state. How I many hear what I'm saying? We were sold into sin through Adam. We've been bought back from sin, those who accept Yahushua, right? We've been bought back through his blood. Please get that. So the death burial and resurrection of Yahushua has given believers access to a spiritual kingdom that has benefits far beyond this physical realm. And if we can learn how to walk in that spirit, we can experience things greater than we have just walking in this natural realm. That is so true. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And Go ahead. I'm saying that because I remember when we had to have this particular paper signed. It had to be signed by a particular time, and then you had to take it back to the attorney. I was out with the children getting ready to go in the grocery store. In the 80s, before cell phones, before by the way. Before <laughs> cell phones, and the most high spoke to my spirit, and he said, go home. And I'm like, okay, you know, the scriptures say try the spirit. And the spirit said again, go home. And at first I was like, okay. But then when he said it that second time, I'm like, I put the kids back in the car. I said, come on, we got to go home. And they didn't like it because they didn't like having to go to the grocery store anyway. And so I got back home. And as soon as I pulled up, Russell pulled up and he said, I'm so glad you were home. I was praying that you would be at home because I got to have you sign this paper so I could take it back to the attorney. That's because of spirit, right. yielding and knowing how to move in the spirit. Absolutely. And, and the reality is, if, if you have been present at that event, now I'm praying for her to, to get home. She literally had just parked the car and had just gotten to the grocery store. She would literally had just got the last child out of the car. They had taken a few steps away from the car. Yeah. And the Most High spoke to her heart, say, go home. Right. So in the natural, it made no sense whatsoever. At all. But she got in the car, you know, went against her natural inclination, obeyed the spirit, got back in the car. Right. Went, now you, can you imagine like you got all these young children. Right. We're not talking about teenagers. No. We're talking about young kids. Some, some of them are, might still have been in diapers, at least toddlers. Yeah. Right. So she then took all this trouble to get to the store only to get a few steps out of the car and turn right back around and go home because she obeyed the spirit. And it was a critical situation that had to be handled in that moment or we would have lost our house at, at that time. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a house situation. So yes, for the believers who give attention to this realm, you will be able to live above sin and experience true victory over the carnal desires. That's not what this lesson is about. 
That's a sidebar, but you need to get a hold of that, right? Walking with the Most High Elohim has benefits, right? There's a, there's a scripture that says, bless, bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, right? There's benefits to this lifestyle. I mean, I'm getting ready to start uh, having church up in this place. <laughs> when Yahushua when stated in Matthew 4, 17, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was alerting the Hebrew of Yahudim that he was preparing to grant access to a life that had not been experienced on earth since Adam. Now, this is serious now. I'm going to read this again because you got to get this now. When Yahushua stated in Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was alerting the Hebrew Yahudim that he was preparing to grant access to a life that had not been experienced on earth since Adam. Since Adam. Let's continue. We're going to get to make this clear. The ability to experience the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of Elohim, kingdom of God, is based on having a personal relationship with Yahushua. Without that, you can't experience it. Romans 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. For those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, fleshly minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity hatred feuding against elohim for it is not subject to the law of elohim nor in deed or in action can be so then those who are in the flesh those who give attention to their flesh those who, who give into the cravings of their flesh Cannot please Elohim. Mm. Get that now. Somebody need to go to YouTube on next week and watch this over again. And, and may have to rewind that a few times. Because those who are in the flesh cannot please Elohim. And guess what? When I first got saved, I was all in the flesh. But I gave attention to spiritual things and I was able to grow in the spirit. That's what got me to this place 45 years later. Successful in the things of the most high, because I gave attention to the spiritual realm at the expense of the natural realm. Fasting, praying, spending time in the word. That's how you grow. And there are certain programs I just wouldn't look at as a single person because I didn't want to be feeding my flesh. You hear what I'm saying? So let's bring clarity to the verse of scripture the Catholic, AKA Christian church used as a foundation for the creation of the Pope and their universal organization. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Yahushua came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man am? So he said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, well, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Mashiach, the son of the living Elohim. Yahushua answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. All right? So there's something going on here. He was asking a question. Who do men say that I am? And, and they weren't sure. John the Baptist, one of the prophets, we don't know. Right? So can there be a personal relationship with someone that you don't know who they are? All right? You're walking down the street, you see a stranger, you don't even know their name. Is there a personal relationship going on between you and that stranger? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's got to be some knowledge of that person, right? And so he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Mashiach, the son of a living Elohim. 
Now, that was something that Yeshua had not shared with anybody on the planet. And so the fact that Peter got that revelation through the Spirit, that meant that he had a, an intimate knowledge of who he was through the Holy Spirit. And so then what did Yeshua come back and do? Verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter. So he's acknowledging him by a personal name. So what he's, what he's saying here is that I'm going to build my assembly through personal relationship. That's what this whole dialogue was all about. The people out there in the world don't know who I am. Some think I'm John the Baptist. Some think I'm one of the prophets. I ask you guys who you are, and, and only one person can speak up at this time. Well, he's declared rightly. So what exactly is taking place in these verses of scripture? A personal relationship is being established between Yeshua HaMashiach and Peter based on revealed knowledge. That's the point of what's going on here. That's the point. The question Yeshua asked was, who am I? And the people in the community thought he was somebody else, but that's not who he was. And he asked his disciples, who am I? And Peter was able to answer the question that you are the Mashiach, the son of a living Elohim. So Yeshua answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven gave you revelation knowledge. So the father gave Simon Peter a personal revelation into who Yeshua HaMashiach actually is. This is the key to eternal life. This is foundational to gaining access to the kingdom of heaven. You must have personal knowledge of the person of Yeshua HaMashiach. So giving thanks unto the father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of a dear son. This is a, a, an experience that we can have down here on this earth today, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. This is something that happens now, not after our, our death and burial. How I many of you hear what I'm saying? So now we know that the kingdom of heaven is not a place that we would go upon our translation from mortality to immortality. It is a realm we access at salvation. It is the spiritual realm. So what about Yahushua's statement of preparing a place for us? Now, I haven't forgot about going to heaven. We got to deal with that. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in Elohim. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, dwelling, staying places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Notice the language very carefully. Yahushua stated, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he is going to prepare a place, and he is coming again. We're going to make that clear. Let's see if we can bring some clarification to this verse of Scripture. Revelations chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Elohim himself will be with them and be their Elohim. And Elohim will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, 
nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Elohim. Having the glory of Elohim, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Yasharel. Isn't it interesting that the Most High Elohim has supposedly chosen to replace the children of Yasharel with the church. Yet he memorializes them by naming the gates of the new Jerusalem after the 12 tribes. That's just a sidebar. But isn't that interesting? This idea of replacement theology is satanic, foolish, and completely unsupported by scripture. The church of Yasharel will always be the apple of Elohim's eye. All right, so now let's clarify this matter of spending eternity in heaven. The book of Revelation, chapter 21, speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. The new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven from Elohim. Then chapter 21 goes on to say, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. Elohim himself will be with them and be their Elohim. The plan of Elohim, his end game, if you will, is to dwell on the earth with his people. Now the question is, is this new? Or has this always been the plan? Do the scriptures speak on this? Genesis 1. Then Elohim said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And they heard the sound of Yahuwah, Elohim, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahuwah, Elohim, among the trees of the garden. It's interesting that the scriptures reveal a period in time when Yahuwah Elohim walked in the garden in the cool of the day to fellowship with Adam and Eve. Did Elohim tabernacle with man on the earth before the fall? Absolutely. We already know that he showed Adam where the good goal was, right? He was showing him where the different rivers were, right? He was spending time with them on the earth. This is not something new. Let's see if it's already in scriptures what he wants to do with this earth situation. Psalms 2. 
I will declare the decree. Yahuwah said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Why would he give his son a possession that he's going to eventually take away from him? He said he's going to give him the ends of the earth for his possession. Psalm 25. Who is the man that fears Yahuwah? Him shall he teach in the way he should choose. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. Psalm 37. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on Yahuwah, they shall inherit the earth yet again, right? For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. Now, where are they at? When they're looking for these, these, these wicked folk, they're on the earth. Those who wait on Yahuwah, they shall inherit the earth for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place on the earth. The earth is a subject here. You will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. Psalm 37 again, verse 22. But those blessed by him shall inherit the earth. But those cursed by him shall be cut off what? from the earth. So that's a topic here. Matthew 5 and 5. Blessed are the meek. Why? For they shall inherit the earth. The Most High Elohim has always planned for the righteous to inherit the earth, even before Adam was created. With this understanding, let's clarify this mindset that mainstream Christianity has about escaping the earth and going to heaven. Let's continue talking about the rapture. There is a verse of scripture that all of us who were in mainstream Christianity following the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine have heard and embraced. Trust me, over and over again, we've heard this. Pay attention. Matthew 24. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour you are down is coming. Now I guarantee you, you watch any rapture movie and they'll use this verse of scripture and when they talk about one will be taken, they're using that to justify the rapture. And the other left is a person, the sinner, who was left down here on earth, right? That's what they, they would claim for these verses here in, in Matthew 24. When we heard this verse of scripture in the past, we believed that those taken first were the righteous who were being raptured into heaven, leaving the sinners down here to possess the earth. But this is wrong. This is wrong. He said that this time will be as the days of Noah. Now, this should be simple. But Satan has brought mad confusion to deceive the masses. But we're going to bring some clarity to this right now. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what happened in the days of Noah? Who was taken? Genesis 7, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostril was the breath of the spirit of life, 
all that was on the dry land died. We destroyed all living things which are on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Who in the days of Noah was taken? Was the righteous or the wicked? It was the wicked. It was the wicked. Pay attention. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things and birds of the air, and they were destroyed from the earth. They were being removed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with them in the ark remained alive on the earth. The righteous remained. The sinners were destroyed off the earth. That's how it was in the days of Noah. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. The sinners did not know the flood was coming. But who knew? Noah did. <laughs> And he prepared, right? Him and his sons out there for 120 years building the ark. Talk about witnessing and preaching for 120 years. Noah and his sons were building that ark as a witness against the whole world. And all he did was laugh at him until the floods came and he was shut up in the, in the door. and. Noah couldn't do nothing about it because he was inside and the Most High shut them in so that their, their compassion wouldn't allow them to open the door when he heard all them screams going on. The Most High shut them in and the sinners were taken. They were destroyed. Yahushua said his day when he comes back would be the same. The sinners will be taken and the righteous will remain. Why? Because the righteous inherit the earth. Matthew 24, 30, 39. They did not know until the flood came and it took them all away. It took them all away. So also will the coming of the son of man be. Then two men will be taken in the field. One will be taken a wicked person, and the other left, the righteous. Two men will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the wicked person, and the other left. Watch, therefore, if you do not know what hour your dawn is coming. So attention, please. Those who are taken are not being raptured. They're being removed for punishment. Read that again. Those who are taken are not being raptured. They are being removed for punishment. So I truly pray that you understand this message. Mainstream Christianity has pulled the wool over your eyes. This verse of scripture in Acts 20. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So speaking perverse means to speak contrary to the truth. So the writer is telling us now that there's going to be people going to be rising up among the ranks of leadership. It's going to be speaking perverse things to deceive many. And this doctrine of pre-tribulation rapture and being raptured, taken off the earth, going to heaven, this whole concept is off and not consistent with the teaching of the word. I don't know how many verses of scripture I've shared where it said that the righteous will inherit the earth. And we read in book of Revelation where the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven. 
to the earth. How many hear what I'm saying? You got something? I just want to say to you, um, go back to what you were talking about, um, about the righteous being taken, this rapture thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, when the scripture says the sower went about the sow, he sowed good fruit, good seed, then the enemy crept in and sowed the bad seed. Mm -hmm. Then his workers came and said, well, he wants to take out the tares. And he said, no, because if you do that, you're going to hurt the wheat. Mm -hmm. So he said, wait till the end. Right. Then we'll bungle up all the tears Correct. and put them in the fire. Uh, they were the first to go. They were the first to go. That's absolutely correct. That's in Matthew 13, right? That's Matthew 13. If you need more information, read Matthew 13, because that's an end time event. He said at the end of the age, he will have his angels come in to gather up the, the tares first, to remove them, put them in bundles, and cast them into the furnace. And then he came back for his wheat to bundle them up and to put them in his barn for, for storage. I mean, hear what I'm saying? To be preserved, in other words. So yes, those who are taken first are sinners. So what's, what's the whole thing about this then? What's the deception? Satan has managed to get the vast majority of the church world to be hoping and praying to be a part of those individuals that leave the earth first. And the people that leave the earth first are those who are gonna get the punishment. So he's got people trusting and believing they're gonna be a part of something that's reserved for the wicked. You see the plot twist here? He's got people hoping and praying to be a part of this rapture, to leave this earth, that the Most High Elohim has already put in scripture time and time again, that my righteous people are going to inherit the earth. I'm not removing my righteous people from this earth. I'm going to be down here with them. I'm going to be dwelling with them on the earth. We're not going up to heaven. Tell me hear what I'm saying. So regarding the end time, we must bring clarity. There are three groups that will be impacted by the end time events. Some will have a positive outcome, some will not. The first group are descendants from the house of Yashorel and Judah. And your heritage has been stripped from you because of past sins. You are among the dry bones that have been scattered to the four corners of the world. And you are being awakened to your promised heritage. This is your time. Your time is now. We have been the bottom, right? We have been those who have been discarded, mistreated, abused. But it is our time to be awakened to our promised heritage. I'm going to hear what I'm saying. There's a second group. And I've got some of those who are, are faithful listeners. The second group are people from the nations who acknowledge Yasharel, who are scattered among them. They are wild olive branches that will be grafted into Yasharel and enjoy the fruits of the kingdom, right? The scriptures talk about that. And I'm going to read those as we close. But the third group are people from mainstream Christianity and other false religions who believe in many false doctrines, including replacement theology, pre-tribulation rapture, and Israel has been restored as a nation in 1948. That is a problem. That is a problem. Any of these things here is going to be a problem because those who are embracing this so-called Israel, they're not looking for the true return of Yahweh's people. And if they're doing anything, they're more, more than likely abusing Yahweh's people. So anyone that, that believes that Israel has already been restored they're already of the wrong mindset because that, that they're going to put them in a mindset where they're not going to be embracing the true Hebrews. And that is a problem. So many will fall victim to Satan's deception because Satan is nothing but an enemy and a deceiver. And many will end up in the devil's hell. So you must not reject Yasharel, the lost tribes scattered over the face of the earth. 
for Yasharel, and that's all 12 tribes, is the apple of Elohim's eye. Though Yasharel has been punished for their disobedience, the Most High Elohim has not forgotten them. This is Roma. We're going to close out with this, this scripture. I'm going to read this chapter because it really talks about where we are and where we're going. I say then, has Elohim cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Elohim has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elisha, how he pleads with Elohim against Israel, saying, Yahuwah, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I reserve for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, Elohim has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let the table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. And we're talking about the children of Yasharel. Because they, they rejected the Most High Elohim, and they chose to serve false gods, okay? I say then, verse 11 says, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. But if their being cast away is a reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And that's where we are right now. The dry bones are going to be resurrected from the dead. Let's continue. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, here's, here's the message here, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Who is the root? Yeshua HaMashiach and the children of Yasharel. They are the root to this whole situation. Not the Gentiles, but the Hebrew Israelites and Yeshua HaMashiach, we represent the root, okay? And so it says again in verse 18, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. But do not be haughty, but fear. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, right? He did not spare them. What did he do? He sold them into slavery. 
He subjected them to the, the, the transatlantic slave trade. He scattered them to the four corners of the earth and allowed them to be the, the, the dust of the field. How many hear what I'm saying? His chosen people, the seed of Abraham, for over 400 years have been going through tribulation and trial, right? So he's telling you now, do not be haughty, but fear. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of Elohim on those who fail, severity. But towards you, goodness, if, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For Elohim is able to graft them in again. If you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, right? You, you are a Gentile, brought into a Hebrew tree, Right? You 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 are out of nature, right? That's wild. That does not normally occur in nature. But the most high was able to graft you in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? It's gonna be a piece of cake for him to do that. For I do not desire, brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Get lifted up in your pride, right? Don't do it. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has come in. And so all Yashorel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from, from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, concern the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concern the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of Elohim are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to Elohim, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so, these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For Elohim, and we're closing out now, has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of Elohim. How unsearchable are his judgments in his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of Yahuwah? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever, so be it. This Romans chapter 11, it pretty much summarizes the history of the Yahudim and the Most High Elohim, he is in the process of calling us home. So you are trying to understand Yashorel or Israel because this is who the covenant is made for. And this is who the end times is all about. It is not about replacement theology. It is not about you know the, the, the season of the church. That, that has nothing. This whole thing is all about the regathering of the lost tribes. It started with Yeshua. I am only sent, but to the lost tribes of the house of Yashorel. And when he rose from the dead, he told his disciples, don't go anywhere, but first to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, find your brothers, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Everything is about the regathering of the house of Yashorel. Don't get it twisted. 
do not reject Yasharel. Be Yasharel. Do not reject and boast against Yasharel because the church does not replace Yasharel. And we got to deal with this too because I, I want to make it very clear this, this whole idea of rapture is really a, it's a, it's really a church doctrine. It's a church doctrine. And so in, in the next part, I'm going to be covering more to bring all this home, this part of it home. The church actually believes that they're going to be raptured up first. And then during the seven-year tribulation, the Most High Elohim is going to be giving attention to those Rev 2-9 and Rev 3-9 people to get them saved over there in Israel. But the church has no knowledge or teaching of the, the, the 12 tribes that have been scattered across the four corners of the earth. That's not even on the church's radar. And so that's why I'm saying that third group is going to be a people during the end time that's going to be a people without Elohim. Because they're, they're, they're trusting in things, they're believing in things that are not biblical. And when their expectations fall short, they're going to be disillusioned. And when everything is said and done, the whole world is going to worship Satan. How many hear what I'm saying? So, though this may have seemed like it was unrelated, believe it or not, it was very much related. And we're going to bring it off and we're going to put a bow on it uh, as we continue this on next week. So we are talking about the Elohim of Yasharel. Why? Because he is the one true Elohim. And you got to understand, I mean, we're going to make very plain, I alluded to it in this lesson today. We're going to make it very plain what is the difference between the end time plans for Satan, for the church, right, and for Yasharel. You know, what is the true end time plan and events? I want to outline those things and make it very clear so that people can see what it is that the Most High is doing in the end, what is supposed to be unfolding, and where the, the, the missteps are, and the things that people are trusting and believing in that are not based on biblical. All right. So, yeah, we just got to gotta clarify this. The Most High has a plan for his people, and it's going to become crystal clear. We're going to make this thing plain, so plain that a blind man can see it. All right. And so I don't know. I'm going to open this up to see if we got any any questions. Do we have any questions or or uh, comments from the field? Nettie, see if you can unmute now. I, I hit another button. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, perfect. I did read about those worms that lived in the bottom of the ocean that are on fire in the lava. That that was really unbelievable. I mean, was, the worms were huge and they were literally on fire, but yet they were alive. So I I did actually. Uh, see that on National Geographic. And my question is, um, until the New Jerusalem comes down to the earth and those who be lovers of God um, inherit the earth, where are those people who have died? Those who have died, mm -hmm. scriptures say that they are asleep. Okay. There's more than one place. It talks about those who are dead have they're asleep in Yeshua. And when yep. when he says when he returns, when the trumpet sounds, uh, the dead in Yeshua shall rise first. Right. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught together to meet them in the air. So they're in a state of, of holding, you know, until it's time for them to be resurrected. Okay. That's the status of, of the dead. Okay. Right. Yep. That was able to answer your question. All right. Well, we certainly, certainly appreciate each and every one of you. We're going to go ahead and bless you with the round of benediction and get ready to be dismissed. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and show you his favor. And may Yahweh lift his face towards you and give you what? Shalom. Peace, nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing lacking. All right, so I want to wish everybody Shavuot Tov and Shabbat Shalom.
And I want to remind all of you now that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we all read some of the book of Revelation today. And I want you to know, I cheated. I read into the book and I discovered one thing. We win and the devil loses. All right. We win the battle and Satan loses the war. All right. Till next time, saints, this is Dr. Russ E. Hoover. We are signing off. Shabbat Shalom.